Thank you very much, Jesper. It's uh, a real pleasure and indeed a, uh, an honor to be allowed to speak at this uh, gathering. It's, uh, it's, it's quite something. So uh, congratulations to Bear for making it to 60. Very well done. Um, probably unlike many of you here, uh, I've never uh, had the uh, opportunity to uh, co collaborate or even work with you there, which is uh, definitely to my detriment. But uh, I remember when I was young and I first came to Europe, I had a postdoc at Daisy and uh, everywhere I turned, Hubert's name was written on everything that I was trying to understand. I remember uh, <clears throat> coming to Daisy and learning uh, about the work that he had been doing with, uh, with Volko Shameros on uh, supergroup uh, Wessemina Witten model. And of course, this goes back to his work with, uh, with Rodansky back in the early 90s as well. Um, at the same time, I was uh, really struggling to understand the work that he'd been doing with Nick Reed on uh, uh, the, uh, the way diagram algebras can uh, influence and uh, allow us to, uh, to get a better insight into the way conformal field theories can work. And I think this was also a time when, uh, when Hubert and Jesper were doing uh, quite amazing things that uh, was pretty much impossible for the rest of us to keep up with. <laughs> So it was a wonderful time when I first came to uh, to Europe, and I have to remember coming to Saclay as a uh, as a nobody and uh, and trying to introduce myself to Hubert, who was very very nice to me, even uh, even after he found out that my French was absolutely abysmal. Um, it was uh, it was a real pleasure. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Today I uh, wanted to talk about something that I've been interested in over the last couple of years. So probably everybody here knows, probably better than I, that quantum Hamiltonian reduction is a thing. It's something that conformal field theorists like to play around with. And so uh, there's a notion of an inverse or a partial inverse in some sense to quantum Hamiltonian reduction. <clears throat> and I think this has been around certainly in the, uh, in the early physics literature for quite some time. But uh, I have to admit that I don't know the history. Um, and uh, I was uh, hoping to, uh, to give a sort of high level talk here, an introduction in the hope that people might uh, tell me, oh yes, you know, you should go and read so-and-so's work on this or so-and-so's on that. So please do feel free to chime in and, uh, and let me know uh, where I should be looking. But uh, hopefully you'll find some of this interesting. And uh, if not, at least there'll be a, uh, a nice story. So I'll start by reviewing uh, quantum Hamiltonian reduction. Um, I imagine many people here know more about it than I do. So we'll, uh, we'll just try to get off on the right foot there. And then inverse quantum Hamiltonian reduction and what I mean by that, because I'm not sure whether it means what uh, other people think it means. And uh, hopefully we'll get to the point where I can tell you why I'm interested and, uh, and what I think it's good for. So motivation, <clears throat> I am a conformal field theorist, one of those annoying people, as I remember John Cardi telling me, who uh, doesn't know statistical physics, doesn't know string theory, but nevertheless wants to do conformal field theory. So, uh, you know, I've kind of done a very rough sort of uh, division of some of the, uh, some of the best known uh, conformal field theoretic systems. And so in the top left, we've got our favorite rational conformal field theories, um, bosons and free fermions and ghost, fermionic ghosts, normal models, all the rest. Um, on the uh, top right, I put in what uh, some people might call non-rational conformal field theories. So here we're still assuming that the state space is factorizable, so it can be written as a direct sum of tensor products of irreducibles. So we know the free boson has this uh, form, but uh, many people say that Liouville does, and I will take their word for it because I don't understand Liouville. And some people say that non-compact Westermino Witten models also have this form, which might be true. I'm not sure. I can't understand difficult things like that. So I like to jump in and uh, do easy things, which is the uh, bottom row of this diagram, where we're dealing with what are called logarithmic conformal field theories. Because here uh, we have uh, correlation functions with logarithmic singularities. And these seem to be caused by uh, non-diagonalizable actions of the Hamiltonian operator. So on the left, we've got what some people call log rational theories, which is where you have these crazy indecomposable representations, but you only have a finite number of irreducibles. 
And so here, the, uh, the flagship is uh, symplectic fermions and things called triplet models. And uh, it is uh, possible that things like polymers and percolation might be described by such discrete but logarithmic conformal field theories. And certainly uh, there's uh, at least some evidence saying that things like SLE might also be uh, in, this, uh, in this corner of the ring. But uh, I'm, uh, I've always uh, been sort of uh, more interested in the bottom right. So I'm gonna call these generic conformal field theories. They are not only logarithmic, which means that you have these crazy indecomposable modules floating around, but uh, they're also in some sense uh, having a continuous spectrum. And so here I include the bosonic ghost system, supergroup westminster witten models, as you there on Volker tortoise, um, the napai witten model, which is uh, <clears throat> about as close to proper string theory as I'll ever get, and uh, more exotic things like fractional level westminster witten models and some possibly most of the W outputs. I've also put spin chains down here as a question mark. It's not clear to me where spin chains should go in general. Certainly uh, some might argue that they belong on the discrete side. But, uh, I'd uh, like to go out on a limb and say maybe they don't. We'll see. You guys know more about that than I do. Feel free to jump in and ask uh, questions or make comments or corrections whenever you feel like. Otherwise, I'm going to carry on. So <clears throat> my review of quantum Hamiltonian reduction. So, you know, in conformal field theory, we're obsessed with chiral algebras. Some people call them vertex operator algebras. I'll call them chiral algebras. And uh, one of the uh, tools of the trade is, of course, if you're given some collection of chiral algebras, can you create some new ones? So you can tensor things together. So if you take two free fermions, you end up with a compactified boson. We all know that. And similarly, in kindergarten, we learned that if you've got an easing model, then you can extend the symmetry using what are called simple currents to get uh, the free fermion. And there are sort of inverse procedures. So uh, the, uh, the inverse of a simple current extension is the group ball, ball the fold. So if you take the free fermion, it has a Z2 symmetry. If you take the fixed points under that Z2 symmetry, you get back the easing model, the surprise. Okay, and then there's the coset construction, which many of you have uh, indeed pioneered. And uh, I will uh, also maybe refer to that as being a commutant construction. And so here, one example of many would be parafermions, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And uh, the one that I want to talk about today is quantum Hamiltonian reduction. And so, uh, for example, if you take a, uh, a chiral algebra based on an affine katz moody algebra like SL2 hat, fix the level K, you can apply this cohomological construction and end up with the Rosora minimal model algebra. It's kind of nice. All right, so the other thing that I want to uh, remind you is that uh, it's, uh, it's all well and good being able to start with a chiral algebra or a collection of chiral algebras and, um, and construct some new ones, but it's even more important for physics if you can uh, start with some representations of your chiral algebra and construct representations of the new chiral algebra. So you want in some sense for this not just to work for algebras, you want it to work for the representation theory as well. Sometimes this is easy, sometimes this is hard. Well, that's, uh, that's the nature of the beast. That's why we do it. <clears throat> so how do you do it? And here I mean, how do you do quantum Hamiltonian reduction? So let's just remember, we're going to start with an affine chiral algebra, so G hat with a level K, and we're gonna convert it into a W algebra and the idea is you want to gauge the action of all the positive root fields in some way. All right, so what we do is we do a sort of Fede of Popov generalized BRST kind of thing. You take the, uh, the vacuum module of your, uh, of your chiral algebra, tensor it with a bunch of uh, fermionic ghosts, one for each positive root, and then you uh, construct a fermionic field with conformal dimension one and ghost number one, sorry, so that uh, so that you get this thing called D, and uh, D you can see there what it's uh, essentially trying to do is it's trying to say let the field E alpha be a constant, right? and the constant just depends on whether alpha is simple or not. And so you do that, and you have to include this extra cubic term, which is uh, slightly uh, irritating but uh, totally standard. And then you work out at zero mode, and because this is a fermionic field, it squares to zero. So that means that your zero mode is a differential. And so what you've got now is you've got what's called a differential complex, 
So uh, you take your affine thing, you tensor it with your um, sufficiently many fermionic ghosts, and then you break that up into subspaces. So you just take the constant ghost number subspaces, and then D naught maps you from one of these subspaces to the next one along. So in that way, you get a differential complex. You can then take its cohomology. And it turns out, which is highly non-trivial, is that uh, the cohomology vanishes unless n is equal to zero. And when n is equal to zero, you get the W algebra that you're after. And this was called either the regular or the principal W algebra, depending on who you uh, talk to. All right, so there is a generalization which is important for, uh, for this talk. Um, so what you can do is you can generalize this by starting from a nilpotent element in the simple Lie algebra G, right? So I think SL2 here, you can take a nilpotent and we'll call it F. All right, so in this case, for every uh, nilpotent F, you can define a version of quantum Hamiltonian reduction. You can get sometimes different W algebras out. And so the way this works is, uh, is relatively straightforward, but of course, many, many details to worry about. You take your F, it's a nilpotent. It turns out you can always complete this to get an SL2 triple inside G. So you get an F, an H, and an E. And uh, it's the H here, which uh, sort of matters because what uh, we need to do now is we will tensor our affine couple algebra with a whole bunch of fermionic ghosts to do for Popov, pop off, but that doesn't quite work at this level of generality. We also have to add in some bosonic ghosts as well. And so uh, if uh, it turns out that if uh, your root has H eigenvalue one, then you have to throw in uh, a, uh, a bosonic ghost field to, uh, to compensate. All right, and so this is just a technical thing. Once again, we try to construct a fermionic field with formal dimension one and ghost number one, on it goes number one. And uh, so we get this new D. And again, all we're trying to do here is we're trying to gauge fix the positive root vectors so that, uh, sorry, the fields corresponding to the positive roots so that uh, they are a constant. And this constant now depends on the choice of nilpotent F. So once again, an insanely complicated calculation tells you that the zero mode is a differential and you've got this differential complex you can uh, compute the uh, cohomology. I believe that it is still a conjecture that the cohomology always vanishes. And in fact, it might even not be true, I'm not sure. But uh, at least in, uh, in some cases, for some nilpotents, the uh, cohomology vanishes uh, except for the zeroth. But in any case, you can just define the uh, zeroth cohomology to be the, uh, the W algebra, which now depends on this nilpotent F. Okay, so that was quite a lot of uh, talking. Um, the other point to make here is that uh, you can repeat this entire process. And instead of uh, starting with, uh, with your chiral algebra and tensoring it with uh, ghosts and so forth, you can just start with any module over your chiral algebra, right? any representation. And then the cohomology will be a representation of the corresponding W algebra, which is nice. Okay, now, there are many, many, many examples, and I'm not going to go through every single one of them, of course, but <clears throat> there are some which are uh, more interesting than others. So uh, <clears throat> in particular, there's a certain case, uh, if you choose the nilpotent just right, you'll get back the regular W algebra that we saw uh, two slides ago. If you take um, the nilpotent to be the negative highest root vector, I think that would be the lowest root vector, then, um, then you get what's called the minimal W algebra. And so uh, I'm just gonna notate that with, uh, with reg and min, just so that it's, uh, it's clear. So if you're dealing with SL2, then the regular and the minimum, minimal uh, W algebras are the same. They're the Virasoro algebra. If you, uh, if you look at SL3, the regular is uh, the W3 algebra, which was introduced by Zanolochikov. And the minimal is the Bashevsky polyakov algebra. So they're different in that case. And you can go through and you can see there's lots of really interesting regular algebras. There's lots of really interesting minimal W algebras. But there's a whole bunch more. There's a whole bunch in between. So if we just have a look at what happens to SLM, because here it's really easy, it turns out that the uh, nilpotent are uh, classified up to uh, conjugacy by um, partitions of N. So for SL2, you have only two choices. You have the regular, which coincides with the minimal, or the zero partition. 
So uh, uh, those are the only two possible W algebras. You get back SL2 itself, or you get back the Virasoro algebra. And for SL3, the cases described are all the W algebras. Either you get SL3, you get Pashansky Polyakov, or you get W3, right? And uh, SL4, as you know, there are five partitions of four. And so there are five distinct W algebras. And so uh, you know, these sort of have names. Um, we've seen the regular and the minimal. There's one called the subregular, which I'll just denote with a sub. And then there's uh, one which is sometimes called the rectangular W algebra for uh, obvious reasons. Maybe you should call it the square W algebra, but that's a bit smart. So uh, I guess many of you know that uh, it's quite often the case that the regular W algebras turn out to be rational. And that's uh, rather nice. But uh, it turns out that most of the other ones tend to be logarithmic. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting, at least for me. Um, just so it uh, doesn't look too easy, uh, you can see that there's sort of a, uh, uh, a, a natural ordering for partitions, which is dominance ordering. And uh, that is also the ordering for nilpotence. In fact, the nilpotent orbits in, uh, in a simple Lie algebra are ordered by inclusion, and uh, that uh, ordering is uh, is uh, is essentially the dominance ordering. So here's SL6, where we see that the ordering is no longer a total ordering, it's a partial ordering. So we've got this branching thing happening. So there's W algebras, and you know, maybe these things are related in some way, but uh, you, know, you always have zero and minimal, and at the other end, you always have subregular and regular. David? Yes. Sorry, was that a question? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Should I continue or is there something wrong? David, do you hear me? I can hear you now. Ah, okay, good, sorry. You're saying some of the reductions are logarithmic, which means you have lost unitarity in the reduction. Well, we didn't have unitarity to start with. So uh, one of the points I was going to make was that if you start with a rational Wetham in a Witten model, which is unitary, and when you apply Hamiltonian reduction, you don't get a W algebra, you get zero. I see. So you're so you, you using non-unitary theories? Is it when you get a non-logarithmic? Reduction? Well, it depends. So um, I think uh, unitarity is, uh, is, uh, is, is not really relevant here. We're always starting with a non unitary theory, and the result is occasionally rational, occasionally unitary, but most of the time it's not. Okay. Okay, thanks. It's a peculiar game. But in many ways, this is. Uh, this is important because it's the only way that we have of accessing some of these uh, W algebras. So if you're interested in you know, certain types of uh, rational conformal field theory, or if you're interested in uh, you know, higher spin theories and uh, generalizations of W algebras like that, then uh, there's not too many ways of, uh, of, uh, of approaching these pieces. All right, so I wanted to talk about an inverse version of quantum Hamiltonian reduction. So here I'm going to look at a simple example. So this example, the earliest uh, reference I know to this is a, uh, is a uh, proceedings article by Alyosha Semikartov from about, I think it was 97 or so. So if anybody knows any, uh, any more history about this, I'd be, uh, I'd be very grateful to learn. All right, so I'm going to look at uh, SL2. And I'm going to take the level to be admissible, but not integral, for the reason that's just discussed. If you take a integral admissible uh, level, then uh, the quantum Hamiltonian reduction is zero. So I'm going to take admissible, which means I can write k plus two, two being the dual Coxeter number, as a reduced fraction u over v, where both u and v are positive integers, which are at least two. All right, so that's something technical. It just uh, means that the result of Hamiltonian reduction is non-zero, and it is actually uh, a Virasoro minimal model. That's rather key. Okay, so in this case, as I've said, SL2 is logarithmic. We know this. 
uh, because the uh, level is not integral. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the reduction, which is a virus or a mineral model, is of course rational. And so inversion asks us, can we sort of go the other way around? If we start with the Virasoro minimal model, what can you tell me about the uh, representation theory of my affine admissible level SL2? And it seems like this should be a, a terrible idea because being a rational conformal field theory, the Virasoro minimal models just have what some people call ordinary representations. These are highest weight representations on which the uh, uh, dimension of the energy eigenspaces is finite. Right, so it's, uh, it's about as nice a representation as you get. But if you have a look at the representation theory of the admissible level SL2, not only do you have a few representations like this, you also have highest weight representations and conjugate highest weight representations. These two things don't have to be the same. You have some crazy things called relaxed highest weight representations. You have even more crazy things called staggered representations, which is where the uh, non-diagonalizable action of the Hamiltonian appears. You also have things called spectral flows of these. So uh, many of you know about spectral flow from n equals two, and uh, it's quite a general phenomenon. There are also crazy things called Whittaker modules, and probably many, many more that I haven't even dreamt up. So there is a, a huge range of, uh, of representations so obviously we can't know everything if we're just starting with uh, with the Thoreau minimal models. We can't uh, reconstruct everything. But uh, uh, inverse reduction aims to construct enough that we can do something interesting. I think you know the main point that I want to get across here is that there is an inversion and it does construct interesting representations. All right. So how can we see this? So. Uh, everybody knows that if you start with the Coulomb gas, you can embed uh, a version of the virus or a mineral model into the free boson. So here my H hat is the uh, chiral algebra of the free boson. And I put the K upstairs instead of downstairs. If you uh, have eagle eyes, um, the difference is just to say that uh, the virus or a mineral model doesn't embed in, uh, in, the, uh, in the free boson chiral algebra but there's a version of it which does. So some people call this a universal Virasoro algebra. And uh, the difference is uh, for a Virasoro minimal model, you have to set two singular vectors to zero in your, uh, in your vacuum module. And for the universal version, you only set one of them equal to zero. You set the one which is L minus one acting on the vacuum. That one has to be zero. So, uh, so all right, so we have an embedding. And uh, that's, uh, that's Feigen Fuchs, the Coulomb gas. And of course, the Wakamoto free field realization says that you can take affine SL2. And again, this is the universal, only setting one singular vector to zero. You can embed that in the tensor product of a free boson and a pair of bosonic ghosts. Hopefully, that's all familiar. So, FMS bosonization, you can always embed the ghosts into something which I'm going to call pi. And this is basically two free bosons, which are then compactified in a special way. So you have to uh, include some vertex operators in your description. Okay, so here comes the key. What, uh, what we learned from Semikartov's paper, and maybe from elsewhere, is that the Fagan Fuchs construction can be traded for the Friedenmark and Ekshenka bosonization. So if you uh, take your Wakimoto embedding and you uh, enhance the beta gammas to this pi, so you take the uh, free field realization of the ghosts, then at the same time, after you've done that, you can then, uh, you can then uh, restrict from the free boson H back to Virasora. All right, and so you notice this by essentially doing a, uh, an explicit uh, construction. You, you literally just write it down and check that indeed you can do this. Right. If you don't bosonize the ghosts, you cannot do this. It doesn't work. But you have a little bit of extra elbow room after bosonizing. All right, so that's very good. But I said that with the upstairs K, this means that um, this means that uh, that you've only set one of your singular vectors to zero. Right. But uh, we've done that on both sides, right, of our embedding. We've got SL2 with an upstairs K and a Virasoro with an upstairs K. Wouldn't it be nice if you could do the same thing with downstairs K and actually talk about the, uh, the minimal models? 
and uh, Adamovich in uh, 2017 proved that indeed this works if and only if the level is not non-negative integer. So for the admissible levels that we're interested in, admissible non-integer levels, this does indeed work. You can embed your uh, affine chiral algebra, SL2 at, uh, at, at uh, admissible level K into the tensor product of a virus or a mineral model and this funny thing pi. Right, so this is uh, this is uh, this is a key part of the uh, of the inverse reduction <clears throat> because what it means is that if you start off with absolutely any Virasoro module you like, right, we know that they're just ordinary highest way modules. So take a module M over the Virasoro minimal models, and then uh, pick some pi module. I'll right? we'll describe what pi modules look like in a second. Tensor them together, and then by restriction you have a representation of your affine. Um, chiral algebra, SL2 hat. Right, so this is a simple way of constructing representations of SL2 hat from Virasoro modules, as long as you know something about this pi. And so the big question is, what type of representations do you get this way? So here we need to figure out what this pi is. And so I'll write it down very carefully here. So it's a partial compactification of two free bosons with indefinite signature. So this is important. So I'm going to call uh, my bosons A and B, and then there'll be some vertex algebras, and I'm going to only take the vertex algebras, which are uh, sorry, the, only take the vertex operators, which are uh, which are exponentiated with A. Right? There's no vertex operators for B, only A. Right? And this is all I need in order to write down beta and gamma as a uh, as a as a uh, as a free field uh, realization. Okay, so. You see here that uh, both A and B are chosen to be uh, isotropic, which means that they have regular OPEs themselves. So the OPE of A with B is, of course, uh, where the uh, where the free boson nature comes out. Okay. So what you do is you examine this uh, embedding and you say, well, obviously I want this to be a conformal embedding, otherwise it wouldn't be very good for conformal field theory. And so you ask yourself, well, what type of uh, um, energy momentum tensor do I have to give pi? Right, so I don't want to take the central charge to be two, even though it's two free bosons, I've got to deform it. You figure out how to deform it so that the central charges match. And then you realize that in order for everything to work, it turns out that the dimension of the vertex operators, uh, E to the N times A, instead of being quadratic, which is what you'd expect, because A is isotropic, it turns out that the dimension is just linear. Right, the quadratic term drops out because a with itself gives you zero. And that's pretty cool. So it means that when you draw a picture of the representation, which is what I hope you can see at the bottom of the screen here, uh, this is the vacuum representation of pi. You'll see I've got the identity field, I've got my A and my B field, which are just below the identity. So that's that's the Fox space for the highs, for the uh, for the free boson. But then, uh, then we've got all the uh, Fox spaces generated by the vertex operators as well. And you can see there's e to the a, e to the 2a, e to the minus a, to the minus 2a, et cetera, et cetera. Because the conformal dimension of these is a linear function of n, what we're seeing is instead of getting a, uh, a sort of parabolic shape, we're getting this uh, sort of half plane kind of shape. And so that's a rather unusual uh, shape for a representation if you're uh, brought up with uh, rational conformal field theory. But uh, if you're brought up doing logarithmic conformal field theory, this is a very, very common shape to find. And so in fact, this would be described as the spectral flow of a relaxed highest weight module. David? So, yes. Uh, question. Can I go back? Yeah. The, so you're having fields of arbitrarily large negative dimension, am I correct? That is indeed, unfortunately, the case. Yes. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, Scary. This obviously is not something we want for a uh, for a completely physical theory, but uh, this is already the case for uh, the uh, uh, all uh, non-unitary uh, affine uh, chiral algebras. You'll always have representations of this type. And in order to uh, to form a consistent conformal field theory from them, you need to take representations of this type. So you can say, okay, it's not physical, but uh, maybe what this means is that uh, 
when you do things to these conformal field theories, such as Hamiltonian reduction, you can fix this, uh, this, this problem with being unbounded below by, uh, by passing to a new conformal field theory, which is, uh, which is still consistent. And are there any issues of state normalizability? Uh, at this point, no. Okay. No. Um, we have issues, of course, when we get to uh, to the staggered modules and the uh, with uh, with the logarithmic singularities. But uh, no, in this case, uh, you can uh, you can put a um, uh, scalar product. It's going to be a non-unitary scalar product, but you can put a scalar product on these uh, representations. Okay. Thanks. All right. It's a bit weird, but uh, this is uh, this is the game we're playing. So we get spectral flows of relaxed highest weight modules, and um, what this means is that up to spectral flow, when we take a representation of the Virasoro minimal model, so I'll call that. Um, L hat lambda, and tensor it with uh, any representation of our uh, of our uh, compactified boson pi. Right? It turns out that we're always going to get spectral flows of relaxed highest weight modules. Right? This is this is sort of generically uh, what uh, what this inverse reduction procedure is going to produce. And so it's uh, it's quite uh, astonishing at first sight. That when you do this, if you start with an irreducible Virasoro module and tensor it with any irreducible pi module, you're going to get a uh, representation of SL2 hat, which is almost always irreducible. So that's a uh, an observation, and it's uh, it's kind of powerful. You would expect normally that when you restrict, you would just get some horrible mess, right? You would get some horrible indecomposable thing, and you'd have to try to, you know, take a quotient or something in order to get the uh, the irreducible part, but in fact, this is almost always irreducible, which is quite amazing. Um, this construction also shows uh, uh, that uh, that the characters, these uh, relaxed SL2 modules, are going to be proportional to the characters of the Virasoro minimal models. And this is something that Thomas Kreutzig and I observed back in 2013 when we were uh, just working out these characters. We were like, well, the Virasoro characters pop out quite magically. It's very convenient, but why is it true? Inverse reduction explains exactly why it's true. Another neat thing is that uh, by starting with the Virasoro minimal models and tensoring with all the pi modules, uh, irreducible pi modules, you uh, not only get generically irreducible relaxed modules, you in fact get all the relaxed modules with SL2. So uh, again, this is, uh, this is kind of telling you that there's something, uh, something special going on here. So starting with Virasoro minimal models and doing this inverse reduction to get SL2 models is, uh, is what we call inverse quantum Hamiltonian reduction. Right, we're trying to reconstruct representations of our affine algebra from something as simple as a Virasoro minimal model. We're reconstructing a significant part of a logarithmic conformal field theory just from a uh, very well understood rational conformal field theory. Now, <clears throat> why do I say this is uh, a very useful thing to do? So in the formalism that, uh, that Thomas Kreutzing and I introduced for, uh, for uh, logarithmic conformal field theories, uh, in the case of SL2 hat, the relaxed highest weight modules are what we call the standard modules. And they're important because from them, you can kind of get just about everything else with a little bit of work. So I want to uh, take a little bit of time to, uh, to describe some history here. So probably everybody here knows when uh, you're talking about representations of type one, these super algebras, uh, Katz introduced the um, nomenclature typical and atypical. So uh, there are typical representations which are constructed in a particular way. They're, you can construct Katz modules using an induction argument. And uh, typical means that they're already irreducible. But uh, for most of uh, these super algebras, there are also atypical uh, represent cat modules and in that case uh, the cat's module is not uh, reduce is not irreducible you have to uh, take a quotient that's kind of annoying so uh, this uh, 
as far as I'm aware, was introduced into conformal field theory by Hubert and Volker Chimeras when they were studying their supergroup with some inner written models. So they, uh, they're, of course, uh, you are dealing with representations of affine Katz Moody superalgebras. So it's very natural to talk about Katz module typical and atypical conditions. So we stole that nomenclature verbatim from them uh, in order to describe much more general classes of logarithmic conformal field theories. And the only thing to note here is that uh, what, uh, what previously was called a Katz module, we decided to call a standard module. And the reason is just that some people, one of whom is in the audience here, had already decided that Katz module has a different uh, interpretation in logarithmic conformal field theory. The name was already taken, so we had to choose a different one. All right, but being standard modules is very, very helpful for representation theory. As we've seen, uh, the standard modules are the relaxed modules for SL2 hat. They're generically irreducible and uh, they're also generically projective, which is a good thing. And uh, it turns out that every irreducible weight module for uh, SL2 hat can be obtained as a quotient of a relaxed module. So in this sense, they're a little bit like Verma modules, but in some sense, they're better because inverse reduction allows us to get our hands on them. More importantly, the, uh, the characters of these relaxed modules carry a representation of the modular group, which means that once you know the modular transformations, you can compute the fusion coefficients using a version of the Valinda formula. So you can get your hands on a lot of sort of standard conformal field theoretic data uh, because of this, uh, this standard module formalism. So I'm running out of time, which is kind of annoying. Um, let me, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, try to give the, the gist of what I wanted to say in the next, uh, in the next three minutes. Um, if you go beyond SL2, then uh, there's not so much which is known. So as I said, Semikartov basically uh, uh, mapped out uh, how this uh, could work for SL2 and Adamovich made it happen in a sense and uh, really noticed how it works for logarithmic conformal field theories. Adamovich has also uh, generalized this to uh, OSP12 chiral algebras. And in this case, the, uh, uh, the uh, Hamiltonian reduction is, uh, is your n equals one superconformal minimal model. And so uh, then you can undo this with an inverse reduction where you embed OSB12 into the tensor product of n equals one minimal models with a free fermion and something which is a bit like pi, but also a little bit different. I'll call it a pi one half for some reason. All right, so again, this only works when uh, the level is admissible but non integral. And indeed, this is the case where OSB12 is logarithmic, not rational. So this works. And SL3 is an interesting case. So this is where I've actually uh, tried to contribute something. So for SL3, we uh, now have the first case where we have two different types of non trivial W algebra to deal with. We have the regular W algebra and the minimal W algebra. Remember for SL3, the regular is uh, W3 of Zamolodzikov and uh, the minimal is Bashevsky Polyakov. And so we can ask, well, how do you do inverse reduction for SL3? And so it's a good test case to figure out what happens. It turns out that it's, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you want to embed SL3 itself, then you need to uh, take note of the Bashevsky polyakov algebra. It's the minimal reduction, which is uh, most closely related to SL3 hat. Unfortunately, SL3, uh, the minimal W algebra for SL3 for most levels is also logarithmic. And uh, with my student, uh, Zach Vahili and uh, former postdoc uh, Kazuya Kawasetsu, we set out to, uh, to figure out uh, whether or not there are relaxed modules for these logarithmic Bashevsky polyakov uh, DFDs. And it turns out that there are. <coughs> and so a natural guess would be to say, well, if I've got uh, the character of my relaxed Bashevsky polyakov model, um, is this proportional to any, uh, any other characters that I might know? In particular, is it proportional to a W3 character? And the answer turns out to be yes. So uh, what uh, Adamovich showed together with Kawasetsu and myself was that if you take the minimal uh, W algebra for SL3, the Bashatsky polyakov algebra, and you take uh, admissible non-degenerate levels, then you can admit, uh, you can embed this in uh, the tensor product of pi 
with the regular W algebra, but with W3. And for these levels, W3 is rational. So once again, uh, we can uh, start from a rational conformal field theory, a W3 minimal model, tensor it with some pi modules, which are totally easy because it's a uh, it's free boson, compactified free boson, and out pop relaxed module for the Brzezinski polyakov uh, logarithmic CFTs. And again, from there, you can get all the other modules just by some standard tricks. So, you know, this is a, uh, an ongoing story. Um, so Zach Tahili, my PhD student, has generalized this observation to all what are called subregular W algebras relating to SLN. So this, uh, this, this generalizes in a beautiful way. And uh, hopefully that paper will be out before the end of the year is up. Um, he's also uh, checked that for SP4, something similar works. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the game has a slightly different flavor, but uh, nevertheless it works. There's a huge amount still to do here. And uh, what I want to finish with, if I can take one more minute, is just to say, uh, we believe that this is the right way to understand W algebra logarithmic CFT. So you can start with a regular W algebra, which is rational. You know it's representation theory. You can even access it if you don't believe quantum Hamiltonian reduction. Sometimes you have coset constructions which allow you to access these representations. So you're starting with something rational where you know the representations very, very well. Inverse reduction allows you to go up from the regular to the subregular W algebra. You will get uh, logarithmic uh, conformal field theory. And this will give you standard modules, which will be these things called relaxed highest weight modules. Okay, and then the idea would be that from the subregular, you can then try to push your way back up towards the minimal and eventually all the way up to the, uh, to the affine uh, chiral algebra itself. So this uh, is, uh, is not at all worked out, but the idea is that starting from the rational regular W algebra, you can actually reconstruct a huge amount of families of, uh, of representations of logarithmic conformal field theories. And that gives you a lot of power, which, uh, which you otherwise wouldn't have. So you can, uh, you can classify things, you can compute modular transformations and fusion rules. You might be able to construct projective covers. And one of my dreams would be able to use this to compute the fusion rules completely and understand all of these indecomposable modules and at least the projective ones. I'll finish with this quote of Escher, and thank you very much for uh, putting up with me. Thank you very much, David. So uh, we are a little bit uh, after schedule, so I propose that the next speaker, uh, Jérôme, start getting ready. And maybe there are some technical manipulations to be done. So in the meantime, if somebody has a question, Oh, we can see you now, David. It's perfect. Yes, <laughs> I'm back. You I can see three happy. copies of myself on my own screen, which is a bit annoying. Right, thank you, David. I have bless you, Bear. I have plenty of questions, but I'll ask them separately. Thank Please. you. So I would be very interested to know if uh, anybody in the audience is uh, is familiar with this idea idea of inverse reduction, whether it's something which uh, which was uh, which was studied in the past. Okay. So, yeah, Iber seems to be ruminating already. If not, then all I can say is uh, happy birthday. And I wish I could be there. Thank I really, you, really, really wish. I could See you be there. sometime soon. Bye. Sometime soon. <laughs>